to Pop Culture Graveyard. I am Hollis. With me as always is Dave. Hello, Dave. I'm torn. I was trying to decide between going with, uh, it's time for more Pop Culture Graveyard and less Nassman. <laughs> okay, or, I was, or... or I was just going to go booger. Oh, uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. They're both winners. I think the first one is an evergreen, though. Yeah. I'm going to uh, go with Hi, Hollis. That's always welcome. Yeah. If you didn't get from Dave's <laughs> intro, <laughs> we are doing a tribute to WKRP in Cincinnati, one of our favorite sitcoms from back in the day. The decision to do this sitcom, actually, was decided on our Patreon. If you want to join the Patreon, it is patreon.com forward slash pop culture graveyard. Our patrons were given a choice of WKRP in Cincinnati. Welcome back, Cotter, and the original Star Trek. WKRP was the overwhelming winner. Yeah. And you know what? Reviewing some old KRPs and getting refamiliarizing myself, the Patreon crowd was right. <laughs> it's so true. Also, Star Trek and Welcome Back Cotter are a bit locked in their time, and that's half of their appeal. Mm. WKRP felt very modern compared to the other two. And so I, I get it. It held up really well. They didn't go for the obvious laughs, you know? Yeah. I picture Les Nessman, uh, Richard mm -hmm. Sanders, I picture him constantly saying on set, do you mind if I get really weird with this one? <laughs> he is terrific. He really is. Just at the top of the show, I want to mention that Pop Culture Graveyard, we are one of Feedspot's top 50 pop culture podcasts. No need to mention where <laughs> we land. Uh, thanks to all of you listeners for coming along for the ride. So for those of you <laughs> who are unaware of WKRP in Cincinnati. It is a show that ran from 1978 to 1982. It was set in a radio station, WKRP, which was, I think when the show began, there was something like 16th out of a possible 16 stations in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Throughout the series, they slowly inch up to a more respectable number 12 and number five and whatever. I don't know that they ever reached number one, but something about this TV show that I think people lose sight of or just simply forget, the lead character on the show, if you think about it, is Andy, yeah. the program director. The entire mm -hmm. theme song is about him. He yeah. is this radio programmer who goes from station to station, up and down the dial, fixing radio stations, reprogramming mm -hmm. them, getting them up and running, and then he's off to the next station. It's what he loves to do. And the plot, basically, if there is one to WKRP, is that he finally reaches a station where he falls in love with the people working there, and they form mm -hmm. a sort of family, and he wants to stay. And the entire length of the show is his journey with these people. Great premise. That's a great way of looking at it, too. And mm -hmm. it says a lot about Gary Sandy, too. He obviously was a sharing guy. He could have easily asked for focus. And I think he quickly realized or decided, or I don't know, the whole show decided, everyone's going to have a certain amount of stardom here. It's a true yeah. ensemble. It really is. And from what I was able to read and find and stuff, they all wrote they all, some of them directed, or mm -hmm. many of them directed. Yeah. And I don't know who created the show. Um, Hugh Wilson. Hugh, Hugh Wilson. Uh, I saw some interviews with him. Brilliant, Brilliant and funny. And nice and funny and just mm -hmm. great. Yeah. 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 And, and he's very proud of WKRP. As well, he should be. I mean, for me, it's a, it's definitely a top 10 show. Yeah. I think folks probably think, oh yeah, that was that goofy radio station show. Uh, and it's like, you know what? It, it was a little more than goofy. It had some things going on. It's worth more than you think if you haven't seen it in a while. Yeah. We've covered some sitcoms so far on the show. We did MASH. We did a bunch of the Norman Lear shows. But WKRP, you're right. It probably gets lost in the memories of a lot of people. And they think of, you know, a few moments. It bears rewatching. When you rewatch this show, it rewards you. It is just way funnier than you remember it being. It really is. And way it's smarter. Funny. It's funnier in a it's funny in a different way than uh, most sitcoms. Most sitcoms are 
one character sets up the other character, the other character tells the joke and the laugh track goes. And then mm -hmm. again, and repeat and repeat. This is like, put a couple of guys in a weird situation and then they start riffing. The phone cops where uh, yeah. Venus Flytrap <clears throat> and Dr. Johnny Fever- They're out at the transmitter. Tra the transmitter <laughs> and Johnny is, Johnny has been his <clears throat> usual paranoid self. And he smashes the telephone and he thinks that he thinks that Ma Bell is after him. Mm -hmm. And his paranoid freak out yeah. is one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And it comes naturally from his character. It's a sort of nuanced comedy that we really wouldn't see until maybe The Office all those years later. Mm -hmm. You know, and The Office crosses over into like farce. It goes past the line, I think. But there are somber moments in WKRP. There's flat out hilarious moments mm -hmm. and there's everything in between. They go after school special now and then, you know? Yeah, yeah. But even in our beloved mash, it could sometimes cross over and be a bit maudlin or treacly or, mm -hmm. you know, tearjerker. WKRP, we're going to get into it when we talk about our favorite episodes, but when they do the serious thing, they do it in a way that you forget for five minutes, say, that you're watching a sitcom mm -hmm. and you just are totally invested in the drama of the moment. And then they'll go back to a laugh and they'll do it in such a natural way that I it's not so. cheap. I saw very specific moments where they stood around in an office being very somber. And then you could almost feel the rise. And one of the characters is like, I think it's time to tell a joke. And it just slides in and you're back to the comedy. And you bring and up a good thing, the timing. Mm -hmm. The timing was right on everything. And you know that it's very much a top down production. Hugh Wilson was a very funny guy. In watching a lot of these shows, I went to my WKRP box set and in the extras, is them talking at like the Museum of Television or whatever. They're being interviewed. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole cast plus Hugh Wilson, except for Gary Sandy, who wasn't there. And he's naturally funny. He's irrepressible. And he was like 70 something at the time or 80. He was yeah. like holding court and being very funny and not in an old man funny or a dad funny, still funny. The generosity from this guy, like everyone, it was the family you saw on screen, you saw on that dais. You mentioned how much they had a hand in the creativity. Tim Reed was allowed to write three different storylines for Venus that they did on mm -hmm. the show. Lonnie Anderson was able to have a say in Jennifer and how smart she was and how accomplished she was. Bailey, was, Jan Smithers was allowed to grow on that show. Nobody stayed in a box like they do on other shows because other shows do the kind of like, there's two or three main characters and the rest are just two dimensional archetypes. You know, they didn't do that on this show. They showed you fully formed people. And we've learned from some of the other stuff we've talked about is it can be rough when you have those three, two or three main people you know, we talked about good times, you know, the non superstars can revolt, um, especially when it becomes catchphrase warehouse. Yeah, yeah. You know, catchphrases might be a warning sign. I would say WKRP doesn't have a, a lot of uh, no. Um, in fact, the only thing that really annoys me about WKRP is the constantly going to the turkey drop, which in my opinion is not particularly great episode though it is yeah. extremely memorable oh. it's high concept you know it's very much a season one episode in a lot of ways isn't it like episode seven or something it's uh, like yeah yeah very early on and i think it's the kind of episode you need because it underlines who wkrp is how they can't get out of their own way and they're they screw up every promotion mm. how bad at their jobs less Herb and the big guy, Mr. Carlson are, because it's the one thing I think Mr. Carlson's in charge mm -hmm. of. It just shows the incompetence on a grand scale. And it's a holiday episode. I think it serves a lot of purposes, but yeah. you're right. When I think of their best shows, that's kind of middle of the pack. Yeah. For me, the Turkey episode is a refund. Refund. Yeah. It's, it's, it's obvious. 
Yeah. Know? It's, and it's, less with I, his, oh, God, the humanity. Like, it's yeah. perfect. But <laughs> yeah, I don't need to rewatch it as much. It's all up yeah. here still in my head. Um, Les has some great lines when he's describing it. An object has appeared. Has <laughs> so good. <laughs> uh, and it's a true radio moment, you know? There's a lot of effort, too, in the episode. Like, we talked about Home Alone and how it, it's hard to prove that this could actually happen. Uh, mm -hmm. That episode of WKRP, he has to... Uh, Carlson has to keep it a secret from Andy and, and yeah. like you have to sort of hide the fact that someone would have said, Hey, turkeys can't fly. Yeah. One of our listeners just went, wait, what is that episode about? Yeah. You got to watch it. It <laughs> yeah. should be watched. Also Carlson can't make a move without Jennifer. Jennifer would have been all over that. So I don't know how, I guess it was well, early in the going. Well, that's the thing in the beginning of that episode, Carlson walks in and Jennifer won't let him look at the mail, just gives him, she's like, this is for you. And it's mm -hmm. like nothing. And then he says, how's it going to Andy? And Andy says, fine, and doesn't tell him anything else. And he starts going around asking people like, what, what's going on? You know, I'm, I'm a station manager. Like, let's get me involved. It opens with his being sad that he doesn't have more say in what goes on at the station. Well, like I said, doesn't it, doesn't it give you great entree to each of those characters? From yeah, Andy to Carlson to Jennifer, it's really each great. Each of their reactions to him. This show does everything that I've heard you talk about over and over again. Another thing it does is it starts just as things are about to change. Mm -hmm. Andy Travis comes to this radio station that is easy listening. Elevator music, as Elevator the DJs music, call it. Yep. So welcome to WKRP. Everything is about to change. And I'm like, oh my God, Hollis talks about this all the time. <laughs> this, this is when you start a story is yeah. right before everything's about to change. And then you mm -hmm. get the unrolling of the uh, patriotic kiss poster. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Why don't we just start off talking about the characters for a second? Let's begin with who you meet. If you go to the real WKRP on the show, Jennifer, the receptionist. Jennifer Marlowe, played by the gorgeous Lonnie Anderson. I've never heard of her. No, I don't think she'll make it. <laughs> She's a character we've seen a million times on a million other sitcoms and movies. She's the quote unquote airhead receptionist who's all looks and no brains. Not on WKRP. Nope. Possibly the smartest person, possibly oh, the most confident easily. and intelligent person on the show. Easily right. the smartest. She really runs the place. And mm -hmm. she gets paid more than anyone else there, <laughs> which is perfect. Venus was asking for a raise and Andy was like, oh, that's crazy. Now you're getting into Jennifer territory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jennifer is the brains of the operation. I want to include Bailey as well. Bailey Quarters, played by Jan Smithers. The women on this show, the way that they were treated, Jennifer and Bailey not only operated on a base level as Ginger and Marianne, respectively, as beautiful, as beautiful and brainy characters. And every boy had a crush on one or the other or both. But they also presaged Mad Men's Joan and Peggy, proving themselves not just the equal of the men around them, but far superior, both at their jobs and just as people, you know? Yeah, I was going to say at their jobs, but even more importantly, mm -hmm. as decent human beings. Yeah. You know, Jennifer was this highly functioning, super intelligent, spoke a bunch of languages, filthy rich, totally in control at all times character. And Bailey was this idealistic, kind of naive, super sweet, kind of tentative and unsure character. And showing that balance was really nice. And seeing Jan Smithers' evolution of the Bailey character and turning her into a more confident person and a and a heck of a news person and someone mm. who is taken seriously as a colleague by the rest of them was really wonderful to watch, you know, and also just seeing Bailey was sort of a, a mentee. She had mentors in both Jennifer and in Andy, who both kind of fanned the flames of her confidence. Yeah, I mean, this is a big, like, you know, this is a bad news bear story. All of these little misfits are going to get their chance to be their best because of Andy. Andy is like this magical character who shows up he immediately says to bailey i want you at my first meeting uh and herb asks her to get coffee and andy's like that's not why she's here she's here to talk isn't, about promotion isn't it great what other show portrayed that dynamic even for a few seconds of just Herb being like oh the young girls in the meeting 
She's here to get coffee. Give me coffee. And shutting it down. And don't be confused. Mid-70s is not modern. <laughs> no. It was the you, me generation for a reason. You, yeah. You can lose your place in the timeline. The stuff they were doing on gender and the stuff they were doing on race was way ahead of its time. You can forget that watching it be like, oh, I guess that seems pretty normal. It's like, no, it wasn't normal. It wasn't normal yeah. for Andy to insist that she's in on the meeting. And people were like, why wouldn't she get coffee? She's the girl in the office. It's like, no, she's the woman at the meeting. Yep. It was very ahead of its time. Yeah, it really was. And also ahead of its time is the respect and honor played to Venus's character that was seldom seen on television. We had a precursor for the way to treat Venus in our beloved Barney Miller with Ron Glass's character of Harris. There's sort of the same journey in that I think a few of Venus's early moments are a little, he's supposed to be the hip guy. He's also the stylish guy. The stylish guy. There's some stereotypical treatment of Venus in the very first few episodes, but that mm -hmm. was very quickly course corrected by Hugh Wilson and Tim Reed, who played Venus working in tandem. They kind of made him a more fully fleshed out character. You know, Hugh Wilson says in one of these interviews that the first three or four shows, he's telling the actors who those characters are. The writers are writing to tell those actors who they're playing. But after three or four episodes, the writers are now chasing the actors. Yeah. And the actors are deciding who their character is. And you see that in Venus because he goes from literally a guy walking on set dressed as a pimp to do not take this the wrong way, a guy who is being articulate and being told by a 16 year old black kid, you sound white. Yeah. That's just a few episodes in. I just remembered there's a later episode that plays on that again, where a quote unquote black magazine, which I guess is standing in for Jet, or it might even be Jet, sends a writer to talk to Venus. And Venus begins to get a little nervous that he's not black enough mm -hmm. for the writer of this black magazine. And then the writer of the black magazine shows up and it's a white guy. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful thing because Venus he was feeling sort of like he had to justify who he was. And then this white dude comes in. The white guy at the magazine is telling Venus how he feels being the white guy at a black magazine. And they, they have this common ground. And the white guy at the magazine is played by a comic, Tom Dreesen. And he was the old stand-up comedy partner of Tim Reed. They were Tim and Tom. Oh, oh They were the first biracial comedy duo. And so it's a wonderful moment, you know, based on real stuff. WKRP was not afraid to blend the actor's life with the character's life in almost a method type of way of writing a mm -hmm. show. And, you know, Tim Reed worked in radio for a bit. Uh, Howard Hessman worked in radio for a bit. Yeah. You know, there's elements there. There's a reason this show can hold its head up today in a way a lot of other sitcoms cannot because they have they, to hang their head they, yeah they went for yeah, the they're... cheap laugh they use stereotypical stuff that will not fly today certain sitcom episodes you can't even air today um, also barney miller put the black guy and the spanish guy and the japanese guy put them in a precinct in new york this guy's yeah. in cincinnati <laughs> right <laughs> now, it's different and I would say that Tim Reed probably used the show most deftly of anyone in it. Tim Reed was like, I'm going to use this show to get my message out. And he did a great job. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's time to talk about Dr. Johnny Fever. Christian he once, name. I believe he once <laughs> says Dr. Johnny Fever Blister. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Before we get into him, I just, for the YouTube audience, I want to show one of my many... Captain Beefheart albums, Shiny Beast, Bat Chain Fuller. It is a promo copy, and I bought it in an eBay auction. It used to belong to Howard Hessman. It was from his estate. So I had basically Dr. Johnny Fever's copy of a Captain Beefheart album. 
Um, and I forget what song it is, but there is a Captain Beefheart song in one of the episodes. Oh, nice. Nice. It was one of the most surprising to me, that Captain Beefheart and uh, the Flying Lizards version of Money. Mm. Uh, I thought those two really stuck out to me. Just give me money. It's gang, what gang, I gang. want. Mm, <laughs> yeah. Gang, gang, gang. yeah. So Howard Hessman. God, he was lovable. Oh, he was lovable. so lovable. And so good. He's he's in Spinal Tap for like 30 seconds. And he's oh, yeah. got one of my favorite lines. He's like, yeah, no, we're we're in town playing the Enormo Dome or whatever. Like, <laughs> fantastic. He's just that was great. a pretty good impression of him. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> he was also in the very successful Head of the Class, which was another show that kind of treated ethnicity with respect and had a very uh, realistic group of characters. But as Dr. Johnny Fever, which is one of his many alter egos that he's gone through in his DJ life. When Andy reaches WKRP, they are playing this elevator music or whatever. And Andy is thrilled to find Dr. Johnny Fever. Actually, Dr. Johnny Fever doesn't exist yet, but mm. Andy is happy to find this DJ who went by many names and used to be sort of a low key legend playing really cool rock and roll, cutting edge stuff. And now we see what his career has been reduced to. He's at this easy listening station. He's barely awake throughout the day because he's so sad and he's so overstimulated or understimulated at times. Who knows? Yeah. And when Andy changes the format to rock and roll, he immediately at the end of the episode comes to life. And talk a little bit about the, the booger moment yeah. because it's front loaded because he got in trouble numerous times, correct? Yeah, well, the, you know, it's the, the story of why he's languishing in obscurity in Cincinnati at an easy listening station. This former great, he was sort of blacklisted. And he kind of drags it out of him. Yeah. Oh, I remember you. Whatever happened to you? With uh, You were pretty popular. Said a word I wasn't allowed to say, you know. Anyway, turns out the word is booger. He went by many different names. And the moment when he decides to turn up his charisma and get back to, hey, babies, he hey, my babies. immediately yeah. dubs himself Dr. Johnny Fever. He cues up the record, he talks it up, and he goes to it, he segues. He thinks about it for like half a second. He goes back on. One more he, thing. One more thing. Booger. Yeah. And it's a two-part pilot, I believe. Yeah, and I he, believe it is. Yeah. He plants a flag. This is a rock and roll station. I'm Dr. Johnny Fever. I'm back. And I'm going to break some rules. When he takes the easy listening record off the platter to put on the <laughs> rock record. Doesn't he like scratch it a few times that, before he... Well, First, he grabs the far end of the record, holds down the close end, and snaps oh, yeah. the record in half. And that, <laughs> right. that's the record that's not playing. Right. The record on the player that is playing, he actually has a moment. He goes, should I? Yeah. And he drags the needle all the way across the record. Wonderful. And says, hey, my baby. You know, and just launches into it. And uh, yeah. yeah. And I love the my babies. Yeah. He's got my babies, and Venus has my children. Yes, my children. You're right. Yeah. Uh, it's the midnight night. hour. Venus is rising. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's funny. Now oh. that I think about it, Hessman has, and babies is what made me think of it. You've got to be kind, my babies, or something like that, is a uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Thing. Yeah. I think that Hessman and Dr. Johnny Fever have a little Vonnegut in them. Everybody um, should have a little Vonnegut in yeah, them. Yeah, everyone should. If this isn't nice, I don't know what is, Dave. I guarantee you Howard Hessman would be like, those guys compared me to Vonnie. <laughs> he would, Rest he in would peace, Johnny. He, yeah. he would love that. He would yeah. love that. But I also want to say, I saw a couple of things where people discuss, is Dr. Johnny Fever more than he appears to be? Ooh, is I he, like it. Please, please is continue. He possibly, is he possibly a superhero? Is he possibly CIA or something? Is he something more than he appears to be? And they give these clues. And the only clue I remember specifically is the scum of the earth episode. Andy, uh, Venus, and Johnny basically have to fight the band to get yeah. them to go on. They yeah. have to they have to brawl. The following scene, everybody, every member of the band and every member of the radio station has some kind of injury. They're all roughed uh, up. Band-aid over the eye, tape on the nose, uh, so on and so forth. Dr. Johnny Fever is untouched. No. 
And I like to think either one of two things happen. Either one, he never fights, but when he does fight, he fights dirty and he's a one punch dude and he never gets hit. Or two, he stood in the corner and just watched everyone else fight. <laughs> If they need me, I'll get in there. Yeah, yeah like, I'm an, yeah. I'll be an alternate. Yeah, <laughs> I could totally see that. I love the fact that there's some sort of like, you know, Paul is dead kind of like <laughs> mysterious yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of legend about Dr. Johnny mm -hmm. Fever. As long as you brought up Band-Aids and being roughed up, let's talk about Les Nessman. Mm -hmm. I think it was the pilot where he's about to go on and like some bit of lighting rig or something hit him in the head right before he was going on they couldn't think of anything he just put a band-aid there they never explained it because no, it wasn't I supposed that. to be yeah. there and so from that point on richard sanders just began putting band-aids various places and not commenting on it and it was such a great less thing because you want to give the audience something to do you want them to meet the show halfway all of us just filled in like, oh, there's Les. He's always bumping into something. Like, right, yeah. It's just, mm -hmm. of course, he would always be hurting himself. He's so simple-minded and absent-minded and whatever. He's um, also not concerned. Like someone might say, like, aren't you embarrassed? Like, why don't you use a little cover-up? Or do you, what? It's a Band-Aid. I hurt myself. Like, yeah. It would never occur to him that it's weird to have a Band-Aid on or anything. It's no, like, it's true. And he's an odd character, too, because he has, on one hand, he has a massive ego. He thinks he's the greatest broadcaster in the world. He thinks he's the Walter Cronkite of the pig reports. And he thinks those awards he gets, like this, the Silver the Sow si Award. Silver Sow, yeah. Is, is or like Buckeye a major, News. Or, yeah, Buckeye Newscasters Award is, is like the greatest honor. But on the other hand, he's almost ego-less. He's mm -hmm. he's less <laughs> ego than anyone else. Again, it's such a complex character. The characters on this sitcom are more close to real people than on others. And Les is just one of the quote unquote crazies in the office. Like if you think about it, Andy is the Bob Newhart character. He's the sane person. He's Barney Miller. Everyone mm -hmm. around him is, you know, not normal. And Les is one of those kind of characters who on the page is not quite right. But when you see him, you buy it. You buy all of these characters. What do you think is the magic trick that you Wilson pulled off here? Like, how does he get away with a Les Nessman? I don't know. I, I kind of think of it like a, like a sound engineer. Like you tweak the knobs. You start off with, you know, you know, you're going to have the rock and roll guy. You know, you're going to have this, um, I don't know how to describe Andy. It's like John Travolta meets <laughs> Luke Skywalker. <laughs> yeah, Luke Skywalker and from the South. You know, mm. like, you, so you start with these archetypes and you get the show rolling and then you start steering people. Almost any ensemble could be perfect if you steer them right. It's all about the mix. Like you gotta, right. you gotta twist the knobs and get it just right. And obviously, you know, like you were saying, Andy's very much a straight man. Uh, though they often give him mm -hmm. chances to go run around and have fun. But uh, Les and Herb, they're the absurd. In a spectrum, they are the most absurd of the characters. Yeah, they're the most outlandishly drawn. It, it feels like this was all known from the beginning because because it's like, oh, well, if they're that weird, why are they still there? It's like, well, they're the original employees. The original employees are Gordon Jump, um, Mr. Carlson, the big guy. Herb and Les. Though, yeah. It's their, it's their station first. Also, it's perfect because those three primarily are the reason that they're in last place in the radio <laughs> yeah. ratings. Those True. three guys. They you suck. Can't, <laughs> you can't just show us all these wonderful characters and be like, you'd be like, what a fun station. Why are they dead last? They're dead mm. last because their ad guy sucks. Their yeah. news guy sucks. And the boss doesn't have a clue. But there's a great moment in one of the episodes where Herb and Les, especially early on season one, them and Carlson are always kind of teaming up. Let's show these young guys. Let's show these cool guys. You yeah. know, it's it's the suits versus the dungarees, I think, Herb. Yeah, it totally it. is. It's very much that dichotomy that makes the show run. Like getting back to Les, there's nothing about Les that you should buy. I mean, he... He taped where he wants walls in his office. It's a cubicle, but he, he puts tape on the floor to denote walls and a door. He treats it real, and he won't acknowledge anyone else coming to visit him unless they, quote unquote, knock. 
Carlson treats it perfectly real from day one. He does. Carlson walks up to the door, stops, and goes, hey, Les, you in there? Or yeah. he'll also knock on the door, and he clicked his heels while he knocked. He was like, yeah. <laughs> it makes it all the more real. And I'll yeah. tell you something, Dave. We talk about how cutting edge and ahead of its time this show was with a level of respect. Is there, uh, hop on the woke patrol, is there such a big difference between respecting someone enough to pretend they have walls and addressing somebody by the pronouns that they want today? Yeah. I, in the words of the show, he's a queer little man, queer in the sense of strange. Mm -hmm. um, here's a guy who is neurodivergent, let's say. He's different. And his boss immediately completely respects the requests that this guy makes to be happy at work. Mm -hmm. If Carlson is able to give him yellow tape and pretend to knock on his door, he'll do it. Yeah, Carlson turns out to be an amazing person, a great boss. There's several times in the very, like as the show is getting started, where they set you up to be like, oh, they're going to have to convince Carlson when he says, that's it, we're not doing rock anymore. But he always says, no, we made the decision, we're sticking with it. Yeah. But you're right, you're right about Les. Les is a, is a strange guy and his workplace bends for him. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Herb Tarlick, Les's his best <laughs> yeah. friend. What me and my friends would call one of the original white belts. Yeah, white belts <sighs> and usually white shoes to match. Outlandishly garish suits, check yeah. patterns, Paisley. I don't know if it's only the first episodes. I mean, only the first season, but did you notice something about his tie knot? It disappears. It's just the he, tie he lying doesn't down. doesn't have one. It's yeah. like he tucked the tie in his shirt. Right. The tie comes out and just hangs there. No knot. It's great. Yeah. I mean, I've seen photos in later episodes where he has a knot on his tie, mm -hmm. but lots and lots of episodes with something I've never seen before. No, it's No fun. tie knot. Yeah. You know what? We talk about how advanced the show was. It was not advanced with the way that Herb Tarlick treats Jennifer or Bailey, but it was very advanced in the way that it showed it and the way that it admonished it and the way that it forced that character to grow. There's a way of being respectful and you can either portray things the way they should be, or you can portray things the way they are. Are, yeah. And how wrong it is. And that's what mm -hmm. WKRP did with Herb. And there are a few things that work with Herb too. He's a complex character. He does love his wife. He's constantly hitting on Jennifer, but the few times that she almost tries to cash that check, call his bluff, mm -hmm. he usually backs down much like a bully when you mm -hmm. threaten them. You wonder how much his heart is in it and how much he thinks, I'm an ad man, you know, I'm in sales. I gotta give the give the lady a let her know I'm there. Like, what do you make of Herb? He reminds me, and this is sort of weird, he's like an Archie Bunker. Uh Archie is to small mindedness and racism what Herb is to lechery. Yeah. You know, he he's a lech and he's a lech to show you that there were guys like this and he's like the last of a dying breed, hopefully. Um, yeah, but they're also saying like, surround him with the right people, let him get dinged enough for being mm -hmm. a dick and he'll start to come around. Yeah, there's even an episode, Bob Ridgely, this great actor, he was the Colonel James in Boogie Nights, I love him. He has like a, a store, a health store that sells these diet pills. And he bought all this ad time th from Herb. Herb finds out on the newswire from Les that this kid got sick with these pills. And so he like takes the news thing from Les and he's like, I got to do something. And he, he literally says he's tired of being the only one who never does the right thing. Uh -huh, he says yeah, it to yeah. Andy. He says he's tired of being the guy without a shred of human decency. <laughs> and so he goes on the air. He's like, this is Herb Tarlick on the sales. And he's like, I made a mistake. I'm not going to take ads like that anymore. And that's the beauty of this show. Every episode after the pilot reinforces why Andy stayed. It mm -hmm. shows you that when you're with good people, you can't help but turn into a better person. You said earlier that you were like, I think it's a two-part pilot. I was like, I kind of thought to myself, like, I think it's a 75 part pilot. 
in <laughs> that this show really does a forward march throughout. It does it in the success of the station. It does it in the evolution of the characters. It spends very little time stagnating. It just is marching forward the whole time, which is yeah. hard to do for four whole seasons. I think it's four seasons. Um, yeah, 78 to 82. Yeah. Four seasons, 90 episodes. You have that box set. That is the Shout Factory. That's not a plug. Right. Shout Factory is actually vaguely famous for rescuing a lot of things. And WKRP is not easy to rescue because of the music. Yeah, the music um, is the reason you can find only season one available to stream. They paid up for some of the bigger songs and they replaced other songs in season <laughs> one and was, added scenes or truncated scenes to make it work. So as someone who has watched chopped up scenes and scenes with this, it's funny because when you're watching with subtitles, you get two little musical notes and it says rock and roll. Yeah. Which if you're watching on Apple TV, that little rock and roll in parentheses is so fitting because it's not the flying lizards. It's not Captain Beefheart. It's not Greg yeah. Kim band. It's a track called uh, rock and roll one rock and roll 15 yeah. rock and roll 30. It hurts the show. It hurts yeah. the show in a major way. If you plan on watching it, I say maybe go out and buy the DVDs. Yeah. Another proof that this is not a plug. They're not the best quality, but they're the only place to see it. So let's do Mr. Carlson. Big guy. The big guy. As Gordon calls Jump. It. Gordon Jump, who I love in everything. He's in the child molester oh, episode gonna... of Different Strokes. Yeah. I had to bring him uh, up. It's one of the best episodes. It's a very special episode, as they say, yeah. with mm. Arnold and Dudley in the back of a bicycle shop owned by Gordon Jump's character. And Gordon Jump plays that as well as you can play anything. That's what's so great about Mr. Carlson. This was the role Gordon Jump was born to play. Dave, he walks a tightrope. You know how easily an actor could overplay this and could yeah. cross over into farce and like non-believability. He truly captures absent-mindedness and good-heartedness without playing dumb. He's all heart and very little brain. There's a scene where, oh, you know what? I believe it's the turkey scene. No one's giving him a chance to do anything at the station. And they show him in his office, bored out of his mind. And he has a, a yellow number two pencil and he lays it down on his desk and he gets down to its level and he pretends that it's being stood up like a rocket. <laughs> and then he blasts the rocket off into space. And it's moments like that. He's this childlike guy I was going to say it's uh, arrested development. His mother yeah, kept him in arrested development. Which is always a blessing and a curse. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks about it. Like, and if you watch interviews with Neil deGrasse Tyson, he is a goofy little kid. He gets excited. He starts ringing. I can't wait to talk about this. I can't mm. ask me the question. Ask me the question. Neil deGrasse Tyson says is that we don't become scientists as we get older. We get talked out of being scientists. We're all scientists from the beginning. Oh. But then... You know, but then you go to say, like, what happens if I touch this? Don't touch that. What happens if I scratch? Don't scratch that. Like, mm. so all your scientific experimenting gets met with stop it. And I think that Mr. Carlson has retained his childlikeness in a really good way. Up until now, it's made him sort of a buffoon, but it also makes him a kind and generous boss and a good guy. This is my chance to say, if you don't get Gordon Jump, who do you get? Yeah, he's the list. <laughs> he's the list. And also, I just want to say, uh, anyone not listening to this podcast is missing out because on no other podcast on the planet are you going to find an examination of Gordon Jump that draws parallels to Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> so thank you, Dave. You're, You're planting welcome. our flag. This is uh, how we do. Mr. Carlson, he's got an overbearing mother who owns the station. And we find out late in the game, I believe, that she's using it as a tax write-off. It was meant to fail. And that's why mm -hmm. she's so contentious with Andy, the program director, because he is turning it around, making it a success. And for her, that just doesn't balance out her ledger the right way. And there are a bunch of great Mother Carlson storylines. In one episode, they bring up the issue of sexual harassment because mm. Mrs. Carlson has a crush on Andy 
and makes him her date for certain things and and he says yes because he's trying to get a new transmitter right and at one point she's telling gordon jump who's confronting her about this she's like well he wants a transmitter and he's got something i want and gordon's mm -hmm. like oh god and she goes hair she like loves his hair and she just wants mm -hmm. to be on the arm of like a young gentleman with great hair she scares andy but then lets him off the hook at the end no one is bad on this show like even mm -hmm. mother carlson she has her fun but her heart is in the right place after a while because again exposure to this family this surrogate family can't help but make you a better person it's lovely so that brings us i think just to andy gary sandy plays andy travis and sandy at the time was an up-and-coming soap opera star Oh, he and, looks like one. Yeah. And they were like, oh, we got to get this guy. He's gorgeous. We'll put him in a show. We'll make him the, the big star. But much to his credit, he knew that everyone around him were the true stars of the show. And like you had alluded to, he kind of sublimated his own star power for the greater good. The opposite of what a lot of stars do. Yes. And he always says the same thing. I was in awe of these people. I couldn't do what Howard Hessman did. I had the best seat to this great show. Just so good hearted and good natured about it. When you say he said, I literally had this great seat to a great show. You can literally watch him do that during scenes. <laughs> he He's part of a scene and then he moves to the back of the room and crosses his arms and he watches five people act. And, so he's good. and you can tell he's enjoying it. Yeah. You know how many stars be like, have me walk out. I'm going to lean on the back wall while these people take the scene. Yeah. Like I can totally picture it. And I just think that Andy Travis, that Gary Sandy is as nice as he seems. Yeah. And you could make a case that he had the hardest role because he has to tee up some of the comedy mm -hmm. and then he has to bring some of the drama. Whenever there's bad news to be delivered, he's the one to do it on the show. He consoles characters. He also is capable of bigger jokes on the show. He delivers the straight lines. Like, I don't know, it's a thankless job too, because everybody who you bring up WKRP and they're like, oh, Dr. Johnny Fever, or like, oh, mm -hmm. Venus was so cool. Or you might even think so of Herb, for, you know, Herb is so memorable, the suits and the, the you right. know. It's true. But Andy so, is, is sort of generic, but he's not, he's amazing. And I wish I could think of the third because it's John Travolta meets, I don't know, <laughs> but like there's something. Would Sean Cassidy work for your- uh... That's, yes. Thank it's, you. It's John Travolta, <laughs> Sean Cassidy in cowboy boots. Yes, that's yeah. perfect. And those <laughs> pearl button shirts, he, he wore a lot of nice shirts. He did. Those Western style shirts. Yeah, he did. Um, Let's each shout out a few of our favorite moments and or episodes. And I want to kick it off. I love the baseball episode. WKRP takes on WPIG in a softball mm -hmm. game. And these guys live up to the call letters. They are pigs. It's all male team, except for one woman. They call her Brooks Robinson because she's so good. They're playing softball. It's a bizarre episode. We hear harmonica. We hear banjo. We hear Les Nesman's thoughts. Les hears his own mother in his head. Mm -hmm. as well as his own childhood playing of the violin. It's so good. Andy's in charge. He's almost like the manager. He's constantly moving less from pitcher to third base to first base to the and outfield. It's so, it's so far removed from the show because it's all exteriors. Absolutely. It's all outside. It's bizarre. Yeah. It is bizarre. Yeah. It's almost like for a second, they were like, let's do a battle of the network stars with just ourselves. <laughs> it does it, feel like that. It yeah. takes them out. And it's great because it gives you more of a sense of the characters because Johnny Fever is Johnny Fever wherever he goes. He shows up, he's in cut off shorts and he's got like a beach umbrella and he's like lying down and, oh, it's really great. And at the end of that episode, Les, who has been like, don't let the ball be hit to me. Don't let the ball be hit to me. Classic. And he makes an immaculate catch. He's the big hero. And whole game, he's been kicking himself. I'm the sportsman, you know, because he does the sports reports. It's so embarrassing. Don't move me again, Andy. It's so the sweet. They give characters victories, which we love. I'm going to dovetail okay. off of your baseball episode. And I'm going to go with the um, Les Nesman is barred from the locker room episode right 
the way it goes down is that um, Les Nessman is doing locker room interviews, which is a thing. And we all know by the, at this point that Les Nessman is not the best sports guy. He doesn't yeah. have his facts straight. He doesn't know the difference between a game, a tournament, and <laughs> this or that. He pronounces a famous golfer's name, Chai Chai Rajaguez. Yeah. Um, which, which is very is much from the Ted Knight on Mary Tyler Moore school. Conquistador also, boots. <laughs> so Les Nesman is barred from the locker room and he finds out that it's because one of the players thinks he's gay. He is distraught and he actually goes out on a ledge. He's going to kill himself because his reputation has been besmirched. How and horrible then, is that? It's horrible. Just in um, general that that's where we were. We're like straight men. That's the worst thing you could say to a straight man. There's some decent resolution in it. They do make some headway and make it better. Herb eventually says, I don't care whether you're gay or not. You're my friend. And, you know, and um, Jennifer says, you know, what's wrong with that? What if, so what if he was, you know, and they, they're getting there. But the fact of the matter is, is that that's where this guy ends up when someone thinks he's gay, he ends up on a ledge outside. It's crazy. Yeah. And they play it that it turns out to be a misunderstanding. One of the other reporters refers to him as a queer little man or something like that, meaning he's a strange guy. And the player misunderstood him. Which undercuts it's, it's, the whole thing. Yes, it does. It In a bad way. It. Yeah, yeah. But it provides some great on the ledge stuff. And I'm a fan of on the ledge stuff. News radio does a great on the ledge with mm. John Lovitz and uh, Les Nesman on the ledge was terrific. The baseball player calls him to apologize. They go, hey, he wants to talk to you, Les. He wants to talk to you. And they hand the phone. He goes, hello, Les Nesman speaking. And he goes, not much. <laughs> so, which means the guy said, which means the guy said something like, what's, what are you, going? what's, going, what's on? going on? <laughs> what's going on with you? But anyway, it is a fun and interesting episode because it deals with that. But I also mm -hmm. love on the ledge stuff. They're, like it's like every sitcom does on the ledge stuff. Yeah, I think it's called Less on a Ledge. Less on a Ledge. That sounds right. Yeah. You know, I was just reminded of a great Less line when you were talking about that storyline. There's one where there's like a dating service is used. Curb filled out the card for Less because Less didn't want to do it. The woman shows up and she's gorgeous and she confides in Jennifer that she's a sex worker because she thinks Jennifer is as well when they're on their dates, because she's going with Carlson. And so Jennifer tries to tell Les that she's a sex worker. And she goes, Les, I'm talking about the oldest profession. And he goes, Lorraine's a farmer? <laughs> it's so perfect. Yeah. But that's how he's childlike as well at times. He he's is constantly referencing well. his mother. There's another episode I want to bring up. It's called In Concert, and it's the Who show at Cincinnati's Riverfront Coliseum where 11 people were crushed to death because of the general admission. The youngest of the 11 people that died was 15. I mean, this was heartbreaking. And it happened before the show even started. The concert happened, the band didn't know, mm -hmm. on December 3rd, 1979. And the episode was in February of 1980. Think about that turnaround. It's like 10 weeks, 11 weeks. Yeah. So, you know, Johnny wants Bailey to be his date. And they're continuing their on again, off again kind of thing. So that's going on. There's this other great like sub storyline where Mr. Carlson has a cold and Jennifer gives him this European aqua pack to wear as a mask. Yeah. And Johnny calls it disco bondage headgear. Yeah. Which I remember from a child watching that with my sisters and just laughing and never forgetting that line. So there's comedy and humor in the beginning. And then they cut from a scene where everyone's leaving for the concert to the next morning's realization that 11 people died before the concert started. And it ends like Bailey's really messed up and Les is so sweet. He gives her a talk. We're newsmen. Them. We're newsmen. Pardon me, newspersons, she says. Yeah, he says it just like that. Yeah. Just like that. And then it ends with Venus and Mr. Carlson in the booth trying to make sense of it. The network didn't want to air it. They had to run it by both, you know, all the network chiefs and the Cincinnati like Chamber of Commerce or something. And they all agreed, no, this is treated very respectfully. Let's go with it. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the best episodes. It is. It's fantastic. And it, it has everything. In that final scene with him and Venus, Carlson gives a little speech about this is Cincinnati. Cincinnati's going to do the right thing. Yeah. And I wondered whether like maybe that was added to help get the show on the air. 
get that episode on the air. Or... Well, funnily enough, something was changed. The ending shows that by the end of that month, there's just like writing on the screen, Cincinnati passed an ordinance that banned general admission or festival seating. Originally, they wanted that to say, here is a list of all the cities that passed ordinances against general seating, and only Cincinnati would be listed, calling out every other city. Oh, I like that. I like that too. Yeah, but, that's pretty good. Yeah, but they but had it's to also it. it's it's combative. it's a little combative. Yeah, it's an amazing episode, and there, once again, there's all this stuff built into it. There's all this extra stuff that it's Carlson's first concert. Yeah, and he loves it. He and he's loves super it. excited. He's super. Uh, guess what? I love rock concerts. Guess yeah. what? Eleven people died at your first rock concert. Yeah. Eleven kids. Yeah, um, and that's what made him feel the worst. I was at that concert. He was having I a good time. It. Yeah, he felt so guilty. So yeah. that's a great one. You have another episode that comes to mind. I'm a sucker for Christmas and Jennifer's apartment. Oh, and uh, Jennifer has the doorbell. <laughs> It's essentially this like three chime version of fly me to the moon. It's like, <laughs> basically the episode is the entire radio station feels like Jennifer's a little down at Christmas and they're all going somewhere and they don't think she's going anywhere. So they all stop by. I'll tell you something. That's a direct lift from the Mary Tyler Moore show. When Mary is spending her Christmas in the office, one by one, they come because they know that she's at home usually with her family and she has to work. So they all end up there. And this was a an MTM series, WKRP. That's right, it was, yeah, had that little Created. cat. I can't hear the ending without hearing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are there yeah. lyrics to No, it's a nonsense song, the, the okay. closing song. We have to talk theme song. Okay. It's hard to think of a better opening theme song for WKRP that tells you the story like Gilligan's Island does, like, mm -hmm. you know, any of these storytelling openers. And it sounds wonderful, the theme song, but the closing theme song is great as well. I just love it that is. amped up. It is a nonsense kind of thing, but I've, I've, I've given it lyrics in my head a million times. Like when it's right. on, yeah. I'm like, went yeah. to a bar with Foxy Box and yeah. Like, <laughs> Met a little I, girl with a microphone in her heart. Like, yeah, yeah. Mine help. is, um, mine is something like, went to the bar and the phone with the bartender. And then I just totally veer off and go, did a little something in a Hollywood bungalow. Oh, yeah. You go LA woman. <laughs> yeah. I go, I go LA woman. <laughs> the doors. That's great. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I think there's actually videos where people have like sort of parsed what they, what oh, they have they? Like, oh, that, I gotta yeah, check that out. Yeah. And they're a good well, time because it's nonsense. What I love about it too is it captures the beauty of rock and the kind of rock that WKRP would play where you can't really make out the words and it doesn't matter because it's all about the attitude. I think about how it hit on the first episode. The very first episode, you open with, got tired of packing and unpacking. Right. Town to town, up and down. So you got this very sweet thing. They switch the format to rock. Johnny says booger. He stands up. He throws the microphone and he starts rocking out. And then cut to the closing song. Right. Which you could believe is playing. Yeah, I think it might be the record he put. I right. think yeah. when Shout Factory took it over, they should have used the closing song over whatever they, if they couldn't get the rights. <laughs> So oh, just every time. Yeah, that every would time. Be great. Oh, that would be so good. Wouldn't oh, that be cool? You know, that would be cool. I was going to bring up, there are so many great posters on the wall. The great thing about the aesthetics of the WKRP office is it is a real time capsule, promotionally speaking, for music at that time. People forget record companies would go overboard. You know, like when you see the marquees of movie theaters in the 50s and 40s and 60s even. And there's like big larger than life promo things of like Elvis, 40 feet mm -hmm. tall or Marilyn Monroe or record companies would do that kind of thing. And they'd have standees of like life-size people or they'd have posters that were oversized and fit your entire door. WKRP's booth 
and hallway is like a cavalcade of these things. It's yeah. wonderful. You can catch glimpses of records and stuff, and you can tell what time the episode was based on the album, if you know the album. Like there was this great poster for The Clash, Sandinista. There's a poster mm -hmm. for The Clash, Black Market Clash. There's YouTube Boy. There's this poster under YouTube Boy for The Vapors, the album with Turning Japanese uh, on I, it. I noticed that too, yeah. There's also a great tubes cut out. Yeah, there is Joan Armitrading and George Benson, because you have Dr. Johnny, you have Venus, uh, The Police, Ghost in the Machine was out. There's this mm. fantastic poster. And then even in uh, like Andy Travis's office, there was like Stevie Nicks, Belladonna. And yeah. it's just this kind of visual reliquary for all of these gorgeous posters from that time. I don't know if there's a greater dichotomy than seeing Mr. Carlson in front of a madness poster. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, it's wonderful. I picture collectors watching that show and being like, oh, oh, like I'd kill for that. That's me. Oh, right, I'm, right. I don't have to picture collectors. I, I, you don't have I'm to picture, I'm telling you. This is a great radio station. I would love to listen to this station. I saw a great still when I was just poking around of Herb Tarlick, and he's just like delivering a line but he is completely framed in one of those outrageous art journey posters. Mm. It's the strangest thing. It's like, what is going on in that photo? Why, who is that guy? Why yeah. is he like on, in front of this journey poster? It's like, it was not like it was just in the background. They were saying it up next or right. here's a little ditty by. And that's such a great device because you don't have to get music rights. If you say that you just, played a music thing right, or that yeah. you're about to play another song by somebody, but you get the shine of it. Like Larry Sanders show would always do that where he's like, our thanks to right. the greatest, you know, movie star in right, the country. Right. And it's like, right, wow, right. how'd they get him? Well, <laughs> Hey, uh, how about Burt Reynolds, everybody? Wasn't he great? Yeah. Bring him yeah. back. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Yeah, they, we got to end this fucking episode, but there was one cameo that I wanted to call out Colleen camp who I've always loved. She's gorgeous. She's in the movie Clue as the maid. She was one of the centerfolds in Apocalypse Now. She's like had a long career, but she's promoting Peter Bogdanovich's film that flopped. They all laughed. And she's interviewed by Les Nessman. And he goes total hard news on her. He's raking her over the coals. And Andy mm -hmm. afterwards like apologizes to her and chastises Les. It's this great like weird thing. I don't know if they decided like, hey, let's, Let's get some real people on here. Let's like Hoyt Axton is on it once. It seemed like they dipped their toe in the water. Like maybe we should have, be and then they were like, no, no, let's not do it. Mm, Cause it didn't yeah. happen a lot. They knew the stories they wanted to tell. And I don't think they wanted to write stories around cameos and stuff. Right. You know, you've mentioned how dangerous those cameos can be. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to go love boat. Don't. Next thing you know, you got three Charo episodes. <laughs> and, 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 you know, no. no. Now I want to see a Charo episode. Come on. <laughs> a place they dip their toe where they shouldn't have is uh, Disco Sucks. They yeah. got on the Disco Sucks bandwagon a little bit. Like at one point, Johnny is running a contest for, I think, the Who Di tickets. And he says, the like, sentence. Disco is blank. And somebody yeah. says, Disco is hell. And he wins. And they win. But there's another episode, I don't know if you remember, Johnny, I guess he's not happy with his money or something. Johnny is stolen from WKRP by like a TV show, almost like Dance Fever. And he plays a character named Riptide and he dresses garishly. I think he might have rainbow suspenders. It's that kind of look. He wears a beret or something, satin jacket. <laughs> he does wear a beret. And it's just ridiculous. And it's it's him prostituting himself to be bigger to be a big star but that is a very disco character that he becomes mm. and it's horrible because the anti-disco movement was very much wrapped in racism that's why i brought it up it's a long-standing yeah. tradition that when something black does well you set it on fire yeah you co-opt it and then you set mm. it on fire yeah well you burn their good stuff and then you make your own crap <laughs> yeah in closing there are so many good things Jennifer's nude pictures, and then the cast poses as magazine people at a magazine called Naval that's spelled Naval, uh -huh. and, and yeah. they try and get the pictures back. The Venus Vietnam episode is another, like the Who episode. I think it's a two-parter, and it's all about he was a Vietnam draft dodger, and Mr. Carlson sticks with him 
And when mm -hmm. Venus tells his story, he ends up get, having the charges dismissed. He's not going to be court-martialed because the guy gets it. The army guy gets it. The story he tells is so heartbreaking and so Real. incredibly sad that yeah. the guy says yeah. general and discharge. Yeah. They attack censorship in the Clean Up Radio Everywhere episode. This Jerry Falwell type, who's played by the same actor that played Jerry Falwell in The People vs. Larry Flint. Oh, he nice. He has a do not playlist that he gives to Carlson because the, the songs are obscene. But after a while, he's giving him a list of songs that they haven't played yet. You know, it's preemptive censorship. Do they and bring up? Imagine. Do, they do. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy yep. if you try. He, John he says, gives Carlson the lyrics to imagine and says, ask him if he thinks this is obscene. And he reads it and it's like, imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no... No hell below us, above us, only sky. Yeah. yeah. And he says, sounds like communism to me. I didn't rewatch that episode. I probably haven't seen that episode in 20 years. And it just popped in my head that imagine was what Johnny brought yeah. to the office. Oh, said, it's fantastic. If he says no to this, then we can just ignore him. Right. One last little thing, one factoid I want to throw at you that I think you'll enjoy. You know the voiceovers where it'd be like, WKRP will be right back with a picture of the cast. Every once in a while, he does other voiceovers. That's the same dude, William Woodson, who did the voiceovers at the beginning of The Odd Couple. Can two adult men share an apartment without driving each other crazy? That's the same dude. I love that. Anything else in closing you want to say about WKRP? No, let's just go down to Snookies and grab a drink. Sounds good. <laughs> That's where they go. They go down to Snookies whenever it's a hard episode. They're like, yeah, let's all, let's all go down to Snookies. Please get on the WKRP bandwagon. If you love music, any kind of music, I think you're really going to be enchanted by this show because it's good people running a music station and the comedy has held up so unbelievably well. Once again, the good shows are people who are showing kindness and supporting each other and yep. acceptance. That's right. And I just want to note that Dave hasn't mentioned meatballs once in this episode. Right. <laughs> okay, my children, this is Venus and Dave and Hollis and Johnny, my babies. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Thank you for Whichever listening. You want Whichever, Whichever you want. Whichever you want to use. Um, yeah, Whatever you want to do. All right, Dave. Good work as usual, my friend. Uh, it's a pleasure. Booger. Hollis and Dave would like to thank you for enjoying Pop Culture Graveyard.